Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Betty Davis and Gregory Peck in Now Voyager. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The title of tonight's play comes from two lines by Walt Whitman, suggesting that to find life's riches, one must often have the courage to search far afield. To little Betty Davis, when I first knew her in New York, Hollywood must have seemed a distant and unlikely destination. But Betty had spunk as well as talent. She came, she saw, she conquered. And in Warner Brothers' great dramatic hit, Now Voyager, she conquered not only Hollywood, but the hearts of all America. Betty appears tonight in her original screen role as the woman who sacrifices everything for love. And co-starred with her is another favorite of ours and yours, Gregory Peck, whose early reappearance was requested, uh, I might say demanded, in so many welcome letters. Letters which have been so helpful in our selection of plays and casts. One letter from our audience tells us a story that I'd like to pass along to you. It's from Mrs. Edith Park of San Antonio, who says, I am 68 years old today, and 54 years ago I started crocheting an afghan. I worked on it off and on and finally finished it, and it was in constant use for years. When it finally stretched out of shape, I couldn't bear to destroy it. So I unraveled the yarn, wound it on skeins, and washed it in Lux Flakes. It came out soft and beautiful, so nice you'd almost think I bought it today. I'm so delighted, I wanted to let everybody know about it. Thanks so much for Lux Flakes. Thanks so much to you, Mrs. Park. And may I offer our belated but happiest birthday wishes. The lights of our theater are dimmed, and here's the first act of Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis as Charlotte Vale and Gregory Peck as Jerry Durrance, with Joseph Kearns as Dr. Jackwith and Janet Scott as Mrs. Vale. <laughs> Untold want by life and land ne'er granted. Now, voyager, sail thou forth to seek and find. I heard those words for the first time over a year ago from Dr. Jackwith in my room at his sanitarium. I knew what he meant. I had been there three months, and now I was ready to leave. I seemed to be well again, but how could he be sure? How could I be sure? I wonder what Dr. Jackwith thought of me the day Lisa my sister brought him to our house. I remember the way he stood in the drawing room, smiling at me so gently. I, in my low-heeled shoes and my glasses, fat and dull and sullen, not trusting myself to speak, and my mother. It was not mother's idea to bring Dr. Jackwith to see me. Mother believed only in strength, never in weakness. What was it she said that day? Oh, yes. She said, I'm ashamed of you, Charlotte. I'm ashamed of you, Charlotte. It was Lisa's suggestion to bring Dr. Jacobeth here, not mine. Your sister says that your recent peculiarities, your fits of crying, indicate that you're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Is that what you're trying to achieve? Well, Charlotte, has the cat got your tongue? Mother, please. Be quiet, Lisa. Charlotte, Dr. Jacobeth has a sanatorium in Vermont, I believe. Probably one of those places with a high wire fence and yowling inmates. Oh, Mrs. Vale, I wouldn't want anyone to have that mistaken notion. A cascade is just a place in the country. People come there when they're tired. The very word psychiatry. Charlotte, doesn't it fill you with shame? There's nothing shameful in my work, Mrs. Vale, or frightening, or anything else. You see, Miss Charlotte, people walk along a road. They come to a fork in the road. They're confused. They don't know which way to take. I just put up a signpost saying, not that way, this way. Well, Charlotte, would you like Dr. Jackwith to point the way for you? I'm going upstairs. Charlotte, come back here at once. Uh, please don't. I I'd like to speak to her alone. Excuse me. Oh, oh, Miss Charlotte, will you wait, please? Yes, Dr. Jack. Miss Charlotte, I 
Wonder if I might ask you a favor. Would you be nice enough to show me around this house? One doesn't often get a chance to view the Vale residence. Very well, Dr. Jack. Here is the room in which I was born. My mother's room. Hmm. It's a fine room. But I'd rather see what your room is like. I'm not your patient yet, Doctor. Well, nobody thinks you ever will be. But, of course, if you'd rather not. It's on the floor above. When I was 17, I stayed out once until after midnight. That creaky step hasn't been fixed since... I'm not sure I know what you mean. My mother heard it. This way, Doctor. I keep my door locked. Make a note of it, Doctor. Significant, isn't it? Well, it signifies it's your door. I've never heard it said that a woman's home is not her castle. My castle, Doctor. Well, you're comfortable here, aren't you? I try to be. I'm here a good part of the time. Mm -hmm. Hello, what's this over here? A work table? Yes. Ivory carving. Did you make this cigarette box? Why shouldn't I? The point is how you could. I have a very real admiration for people who are clever with their hands. I was always very clumsy with my own. I would say that you're one of the least clumsy persons I've ever known. Oh, uh, you wouldn't happen to have a cigarette hidden away someplace, would you? Do you think I hide cigarettes in my room? Oh, no, 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 no. I meant... Where that... do I hide them, Doctor? On the shelves behind the books? Cigarettes and medicated sherry and novels my mother would never allow me to read. Oh, please, it was only the box that reminded me. Oh, how very perceiving you are. How very right you are. You see, I was about to hide this album. You really should look at it, though. It wouldn't do for you to come all the way up here and miss your amusement. Look at it, Doctor. The intimate journal of Miss Charlotte Vale, spinster. Oh, dear. Won't anything convince you that I don't wish to pry? Oh, but you must pry. I insist that you do. Here's the record of my last trip abroad with my mother. You wouldn't have known me then. I was 20 then, and I was in love. Oh, Miss Vale. Oh, don't be embarrassed. I'm not. Here's his picture. I'd never met a man like Leslie before. I'd hardly ever met a man. Mother sorted of that. Leslie loved me. He wanted to marry me. But he wasn't suitable, my mother said. What man is suitable, doctor? She's never found one. What man would ever say to me, I want you? Look at me. I'm fat. My mother disapproves of the foul derails of diet. Look at my shoes. My mother approves of sensible shoes. Look at my glasses. You'll never get another pair of eyes, my mother says. Look at the books on my shelves. My mother approves of good, solid books. I am my mother's well-loved daughter. I am my mother's companion. I am my mother's servant. My mother says, my mother, my mother, my mother. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. Look up here. You'll never get another pair of eyes, as your mother says, if you... Spoil them with tears. Oh, Dr. Jackwith, when you were talking downstairs, when you talked about the fork in the road, there are other forks further along the road. So many. Yes. Put away your book and come downstairs. I'll go ahead. Well, Doctor, it's just as I said, isn't it? Just nonsense. Mrs. Vale. Charlotte's no more ill than a molting canary. Of course, she's my youngest, you know. The child of my age. My ugly duckling. I suppose it's true that all late children are mocked. Often such children are not wanted. That can mock them. Dr. Jackwith, are you telling I've me that I... I've been trying to tell you that your daughter is seriously ill, thanks to you. Thanks if to you me? If you had deliberately and maliciously planned to destroy your daughter's life, you couldn't have done it more completely. How? By having exercised a mother's rights. Oh, a mother's rights, Twaddle. A child has rights. To discover her own mistakes, to make her own way, to grow and blossom in her own particular soil. Are you getting into botany, Doctor? Are we flowers? I, uh, I'm trying to help your daughter. I suggest a few weeks at Cascade. I spent three months at Cascade. Outwardly, Dr. Jackwith worked a miracle. I had lost weight. I was looking better. My hands were steady. Inwardly, I didn't know. And then came that morning when Dr. Jackwith told me I could leave. Well, the time has come for you to get out of the nest, Charlotte. Try your own wings. You mean go home? No, no. Go out and take a good look at the world. On your own. Forget you're a hidebound New Englander. Meet people. Talk to them. I, I'd be afraid. Charlotte, the other day I referred to a quotation. Do you remember? Yes, you said it was from Walt Whitman. That's right. 
Well, I've had it looked up. He's put into words what I'd like to say to you far better than I could ever express it. He says, Untold want by life and land ne'er granted. Now, voyager, sail thou forth to seek and find. I sailed in three days, a pleasure cruise to South America. Lisa had secured space aboard ship because a girl she knew, Renee Beauchamp, decided suddenly to go to Arizona instead. It was too late for my name to go on the passenger list, and so I was known to the deck stewards and to the head waiter as Miss Beauchamp. I dreaded the embarrassment to explain this to the passengers, so I, I simply avoided them and stayed in my cabin. When we reached Campos, I decided to go ashore. Renee had helped me with my wardrobe, insisted, in fact, that I take half a trunk full of her own clothes. As I came down the steps to the tender, I knew people were looking at me. I was panic-stricken. My plucked eyebrows, my new hairdo, the lipstick I wore, my, my borrowed clothes. At the bottom of the ladder, a man was smiling at me. Excuse me, Miss Beauchamp. My name's Jerry Durance. It seems you've got the only shore carriage left, and the steward suggested that you might be willing to share it with someone. Well, really... I know it's an inconvenience. If it's too much, just say so. Well, if you can stand it, I should be able to. Oh, thank you. I've enjoyed myself today. Have you? You know, Miss Beauchamp, haven't I, I read about you in the newspapers, the girl who jumps horses so well, or is it tennis? You've never read about me in a newspaper. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I guess I'm mistaken. Nevertheless, you're quite different from what I expected. Please listen. Renee Beauchamp is in Arizona. I took her space at the last moment. I, I don't know why I'm telling you this, a stranger. <laughs> no, you're the stranger. You know who I am. My name is Vale. If it ever appears on the passenger list, it will be C. Vale, Boston. One of the Vales of Boston? One of the lesser ones. Well, which one, Miss or Mrs.? It's Aunt. Every family has one, you know. But Aunt what? My name is Charlotte Vale. Miss Charlotte Vale. Do you mind if we go? Oh, Miss Vale, I, I hope I didn't offend you. You know, it, it's like me to blunder just when I was going to ask you for a favor. I've got some shopping to do for my daughters, and, well, I need a woman's help. Of course. A spinster aunt is an ideal person to select presents for young girls. Miss Vale, I wish I understood you. He wishes he understood me. He wishes. You know, I think we did very well. The jewelry's just right for Beatrice and the sweater for Tina. How old is Tina? Here, I've got a picture. <laughs> this is my harem, all girls. Who is that knitting? Oh, well, that's, that's Isabel, my wife. Picture is very good of her. She'd only looked up and smiled. And that's Beatrice next to her. Then that must be Tina sitting cross-legged on the grass. <laughs> yes. We hope she won't have to wear glasses all her life. Tina wouldn't smile for me either. She's convinced she's an ugly duckling. Does Tina know she wasn't wanted? Now, well, there's an odd remark. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I made it. Well, I mean odd because it's so close to the truth. Even before she was born, her mother... Well, never mind that. Here's a slight offering for being my guide today. It's a mixture of several kinds of flowers. It's called Jolie Fleur. Oh, oh, thank you very much. I'll put some on my handkerchief tonight. Will you? Good. Let's meet in the lounge for a cocktail. Before... All right. In my hand as I walked away was the bottle of perfume. My heart was beating wildly like a schoolgirl's. It was the first gift any man had ever given me. Hello. Hello. Sit down, Miss Vale. You know, you made a striking impression over there. She stood in the doorway looking for me. I probably put on too much lipstick. No, not that I noticed. I did notice that wrap at once. What's that? What's what? There's something on your wrap. Pinned on. It's a note. Well, somebody's playing a joke on you, I guess. Unpin it and read it. This cape always makes an impression. I hope it'll do the same for you. What's it mean? It means that this cape belongs to Renee Bushel. She lent it to me. Oh, I see. Your wings are borrowed. Well, they suit you just the same. No, they don't. They don't suit me at all. In fact, they're perfectly ridiculous. You're quite right. Someone is playing a joke on me. 
Only it's far funnier than you realize. You aren't going, are you? Yes, please. Well, Jerry. Mac and Deb, too. Well, how are you? Hi, Jerry. We're joining your ship. Oh, wonderful. Oh, these are my old friends, Deb McIntyre and Frank. And my new friend, Miss uh, uh, Beauchamp. How do you do? Is this Rene Beauchamp? No, no, another one altogether. This is uh, uh, Camille Beauchamp. Excuse me, please. Good night. Good night. Oh, wait, Miss Beauchamp. I'll see you later, Deb. Oh, sure. Wait a minute, please, Will. Now, why did you run out on me? Did you have to introduce me like that? Well, it wasn't up to me to let the cat out of the bag. Did I do wrong? Why did you call me Camille? Well, the only French name I could think of besides Fifi. I suppose that's meant to be funny. My wife calls my lighter moments trying to be funny. I, I intended a compliment. In that dress, you're rather like a chameleon. Likely. You haven't a very high opinion of yourself, have you? Perhaps this will help you know why. You showed me a photograph, now I'll show you one. A picture of my family. <laughs> family is right. Who's this, your grandmother? No, my mother. Oh, a very strong character, I'd say. And these? My brothers and their wives. Oh, they're so much older. Who's the fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair? A spinster aunt. Oh, well, where are you taking the picture? I'm the fat lady with the heavy brows and all the hair. <laughs> I'm poor Aunt Charlotte, and I've been ill. I've been in a sanitarium for three months, and I'm not well yet. And I... And I... Forgive me. Uh, of course. Feeling better? Much. Thanks to you. Oh, many, many thanks to you. Thanks for what? Oh, for sharing my carriage today, and, and for walking my legs off sightseeing, and... And for helping me feel that there were a few moments when I, when I almost felt alive. Thank you. Thank you who? Thank you, Jerry. Good night. Good night, Camille. Sleep well. In the next few days, I learned about Jerry Dance. His friend Deb told me. Deb talked a great deal. How much has Jerry told you about his life at home? Oh, that he was married. In fact, he showed me a snapshot of his family. He seemed very proud of them. He would. He's right out of the age of chivalry, that boy. If you mean thoughtful and considerate. Oh, dishwater. You don't know what I'm talking about. I'm afraid I don't. I'm talking about his home, his marriage. Honestly, when I see what a woman like Isabel can do to a man like Jerry, it makes me boil. He doesn't have to stand for it, does he? Oh, yes, he does. His kind always do. The weak have a great strength, you know, when they're clinging to something decent and fine. He's been cursed from the very first day he met Isabel by a ruling passion not to hurt her. She's not too well, you know. There must be something more. He married her. Yes, he married her. Isabel was a girl who believed that a kiss required a proposal. She's been draped around his neck ever since. Well, he struggled with his architecture till she made him give it up. He wasn't making enough money. The only thing he ever loved. Isabel kept reminding him that he was now a married man with responsibilities. When they had their first child, she considered herself a great martyr. And she's played the martyr ever since. That's her grasp on him. Her martyrdom, her jealousy, and when they fail, her weak heart. She can't have reason to be jealous. Oh, if you mean, does Jerry have flings with other women? No. She's jealous mostly of Tina, the child she never wanted. And yet, if you could hear her sanctimonious maternal tone when she lets it leak out what a self-sacrificing mother she's been. No, Jerry doesn't know. Or if he knows, he refuses to understand and do something about it. He only insists on enduring. And so I found out that Jerry was unhappy too. Then one evening in Rio, our car broke down on the mountainside. We talked all night, Jerry and I. Toward dawn, I lay down beside the fire he had built. And when he thought I was sleeping, he leaned over quietly and kissed my cheek. My boat sailed without me. The next night, back at the hotel, we stood on the balcony looking over the harbor. You can rejoin your cruise in Buenos Aires. There's a plane going down first thing in the morning. Then there's another plane going down in five days. It'll get you there the same day as your ship. Oh, 
know anybody in Buenos Aires? No. Oh, it seems a shame to rush down there to spend five days alone. But you'll be busy here. Oh, my business can wait. And we did start off for a tour. We started off for somewhere. Uh, if I promise to sit at a different table in the dining room and say, good morning, Miss Vale, I hope you slept well. So people will hear me and never guess that I'm head over heels in love with you. Will you stay? Now, don't say no, Camille. Say, I'll see. Uh, I'll see. I must go in now. No, not yet. Look at the harbor. Isn't it beautiful? Do you... Do you believe in immortality? I don't know. Do you? Oh, I want to believe that there's a chance for such happiness to be carried on somehow, somewhere. Are you happy, then? <laughs> Close to it. Getting warmer and warmer, as we used to say as kids. Remember? Look out or you'll get burned, we used to say. Are you afraid of getting burned if you get too close to happiness? I'm immune to happiness and therefore to burns. You weren't immune last night on the mountain. Do you call that happiness? Oh, small part. There are other kinds. Such as? Having fun together. Getting a kick out of simple little things, out of beauty like this. Sharing confidences we wouldn't share with anybody else in all the world. Charlotte. Won't you be honest and tell me that you're happy, too? Since that night on the boat when you told me about your illness, I... I can't get you out of my mind, or out of my heart, either. If I were free, there'd be only one thing I'd want to do. Prove you're not immune to happiness. My oh, darling, you're crying. Oh, I'm such a fool. Such an old fool. These are only tears of gratitude. An old maid's gratitude. Oh, don't talk like you that. You see, no one ever called me darling before. Well, there's my plane. Yeah. I hate goodbyes. Oh, it don't matter. It's what's gone before. No. It's what can't go after. But we'll see each other sometime. No, we promised we're both to go home. Will it help you to know I'll miss you every moment? So will I, Jerry. So will I. Depresa, senores. Depresa, senores. Goodbye, darling. Darling. Goodbye. Goodbye, Jerry. Our stars Betty Davis and Gregory Peck will return in Act Two of Now Voyager in a moment. Psychologists say that they can tell a great deal about what we've been doing by the way we associate words. For instance, if I say three, what other word do you think of, Libby? Three? Why, three strangers. Hmm, how did you arrive at that? Well, I've just seen a preview of Warner Brothers' new picture by that name. It's a real thriller. I can still feel the chills going down my spine. Suppose I said three again. Oh, since we've been talking about the picture, I think of two times three, which is six. What has six to do with three strangers? Six is the number of glamorous outfits Geraldine Fitzgerald wears in the picture. I counted them. Milo Anderson designed a blue negligee for her that's really the ultimate in luxury. And if I still persist in saying three? Well, since we've been talking about a negligee, I'd recall that pretty underthings stay lovely three times as long when they're given gentle lux care. Yes, there are three things to watch out for. Strong soap, hot water, and rough handling. Washing tests prove that these things make colors look faded and drab much too soon. All sorts of misfortunes can follow if slips and nighties get harsh wash day treatment. Of course, not as harrowing as the things Peter Laurie and Sidney Greenstreet experience in the picture. But frayed straps and burst out seams can be a personal tragedy if it's a favorite slip. Especially now when nice ones are so hard to buy. A tragedy you can avoid with Lux Care. Washing tests proved that under things washed the Lux way stayed lovely three times as long. Yes, Lux Care is certainly thrifty. Lux is thrifty in another way, too. A little Lux goes a long way. Use all the Lux you need to get rich suds. But don't use more than you need. Soap is too precious these days to be wasted. Back now to William Keeley, our producer. Our curtain rises on the second act of Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis as Charlotte Vale and Gregory Peck as Jerry Durrance, with Joseph Kearns as Dr. Jackwith. May I 
returned to New York and went at once to see Dr. Jackwith. He was delighted with the change he saw in me, but even he didn't know how much I had changed or why. The final test was still to come when I went home to see Mother. I stood there outside her room, my heart beating wildly. In my mind, I kept hearing Dr. Jackwith's words. Just remember that honoring one's parents is still a pretty good idea. You're going to be a shock to her. I advise you to soften the blow. Give her time to get used to you. Give her time. Hello, Mother. So, you've decided to come back. You're looking very well, Mother. Lisa told me you'd been ill. Lisa but... knows nothing about me. Step over there where I can see you. Now turn around. It's worse than Lisa led me to suppose. Much worse. Yeah. I shall be wearing my white lace gown tonight. I'd like you to wear your black and white foulard. But, Mother, I've lost over 25 pounds. It won't fit. There's something else I want to say to you. Now that you have come home to take up your duties as a daughter again, I'm dismissing the last nurse. I'm to having a room occupied on the same floor with me. And in view of my heart, I agree it's a wise precaution. You will occupy your father's room from now on. I had William move down all your things yesterday. Mother, you had no right to move my things. No right in my own house to move what I see fit? Mother. I think if you wear your glasses tonight, you'll be less of a shock to the others. And take off whatever you've got on your face. As to your hair and eyebrows, you can say that often after a severe illness, one loses one's hair. But you're letting yours grow as quickly as possible. Mother, if you'll excuse me, I'll go to my room. As I walked from the room, I knew the illusion was over. This was my life, this was my mother. This was my home, and the bars of reality were unbending. But that evening, some flowers arrived, his flowers, a box of camellias, and with them, a renewal of my courage. Charlotte? Yes, Mother? What are you doing in your old room? I had my things moved back. I'm going to sleep here. Didn't you understand I wished someone to sleep in the room next to mine? We can get one of the maids, Mother. Perhaps Hilda. As long as I pay the bills, I'm running this house. Please remember you're a guest, Charlotte. Well, if I am one, then please treat me like one, Mother. Your guest prefers to sleep in this room, if you don't mind. This is no time for humor. Where did those flowers come from? From New York. Who sent them? I've forgotten the name of the florist. In other words, you don't intend to tell me. Mother, I don't want to be disagreeable or unkind. I've, I've come home to live with you again here in the same house, but it can't be in the same way. I've been living my own life, making my own decisions for a long while now. It's impossible to go back to being treated like a child again. Where did you get that dress? I bought it in New York today. It's outrageous. Where's the black and white foulard? I gave it to Hilda. She was so grateful. Mother. Mother, please be fair and meet me halfway. They told me before you were born that my recompense for having a late child was the comfort the child would be to me in my old age, especially if she were a girl. And on your first day home after six months' absence, you behave like this. Mother, wait for me. I'll go downstairs with Thank you. Thank you. I prefer to go alone. Mother, please, you know you're not oh. supposed to. Mother! Dora, come here quickly. Mother's fallen downstairs. <laughs> She was not badly hurt, a torn ligament in her ankle, but it was enough to keep her in her bed during the party. I was a great surprise to the family that night, and as they left, one of the guests stayed on to speak to me at the door, Elliot Livingston. Well, Miss Vale? Well, Mr. Livingston? You know, I still can't get over our not having met. Well, as a matter of fact, we have, once and almost twice. Oh, I'm mystified. Well, the once was when we were children, you were the only boy who danced with me at dancing school, and the almost is when you were supposed to usher at my coming out party and didn't show up. I'm covered with shame. <laughs> I shouldn't have told you it wasn't nice. Well, I, I hope you're going to allow me to make up for my past rudeness. May I telephone you sometime? Of course, any time. Good night. Good night. How's your ankle, Mother? It's extremely painful. I'm so sorry. I've been doing some thinking as I've been lying here in pain, listening to you all having a good time downstairs. How much did that dress cost? It was frightfully expensive. Go to sleep now, Mother. I'll tell you about it in the morning. To whom did you charge it? To whom I've always charged my clothes, Mother. And you expect me to pay for articles charged to me of which I do not approve? Well, I could pay for it myself. I've saved quite a little money. I have about $5,000. $5,000 won't last very long. 
especially if your monthly allowance were to be discontinued. Oh, I see. Charlotte, I'm willing you should occupy your old room until I dismiss the nurse. That will give you a chance to think over what I've said. I'm very glad to give a devoted daughter a home under my roof and pay all her expenses, but not if she scorns my authority. Well, I could earn my own living, Mother. As a matter of fact, I've often thought about it. I'd make a very good head waitress in a restaurant, or I could... You may think that very funny, but I guess you'd be laughing out of the other side of your face if I did carry out your suggestion. I don't think I would. You see, Mother, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Summer, winter, and then spring again. Between Mother and me, there was a sort of armed truce. In her own way, I think she respected me for what she called my stubbornness. And then there was the matter of Elliot Livingston. Why haven't you accepted Elliot? Do you imagine there's a Livingston waiting for you on every corner? I've been waiting to see how you feel about it, Mother. <sighs> you know well as I do. Makes no difference to you how I feel about it. You always do exactly as you please. I think you're pleased. I'm nothing of the kind. I'm only so astonished that you of all the family should bring such a feather to the family cap. Then if you really do approve, Mother dear, oh, why... Keep all that soft talk for Elliot. <laughs> Mother, there's no one like you. That night I told Elliot I would marry him. Our wedding was set for June. Mother was pleased and I was too. Then three weeks before the wedding, I saw Jerry again. There was a party at George Weston's house. In a room full of people, I saw him, and it was just as if we'd never been apart. George noticed immediately. Why, what's the matter, Charlotte? George, I, I think I know that man over there. Oh, Jerry Durrance. He's been doing a job for me since March. Architect for the medical center. Shall I tell him your name or let him guess? Oh, let him guess. Right, come along. Oh, Jerry, here's someone who thinks she's met you before. Why, oh, yes, of course. You do look familiar. Now, don't tell me your name. I've got it. Uh, Beauchamp, isn't it? Camille Beauchamp? I'm sorry, Jerry, but you're wrong. My name is Vale. I met you on a pleasure cruise once. Oh, yes, Miss Vale. I hope you'll forgive me. I'll leave you two alone to make your own peace. George tells me you've been in Boston quite often, Mr. Durrance. And I didn't know. Oh, yes, several times. You look simply glorious. An architect. Oh, Jerry, I could cry with pride. I wanted horribly to call you up. I walked by your house on Marlborough Street. Once I almost rang the bell. Oh, why didn't you? Tell me about Deb and Mac. You introduced me to them on the pleasure cruise, remember? Oh, they're all fine. And how is Tina? Well, Tina, we're having quite a bad time with Tina. Tell me about it. I'm afraid we've got to send her away somewhere. Doctor thinks she shouldn't be with her mother. I took her to see Dr. Jackwith. He was highly recommended to me by this Camille Beauchamp I mistook for you. Charlotte, I've got to see you. May I come to your house tonight? I won't stay but ten minutes. I must talk to you. Yes, I'll be waiting. Hello. Hello, Charlotte. Jerry, why haven't you come? I've been home for hours. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm leaving tonight on the midnight. But why? Well, I've got to get back on business. I heard the news. You're going to marry Elliot Livingston. Oh, I wanted to tell you. I just wanted to say I think he's a fine person. And... Jerry, where are you now? I've got to see you. Charlotte, I think it's best that we don't. Are you at the station? Goodbye. Jerry. Jerry. Jerry, wait. Charlotte, you shouldn't have come. I had to. I want to talk to you about Elliot. Why are you marrying him? Are you in love with him? No, not like we are. Not like us. I thought it might grow to be something like it. I thought I was getting over you, Jerry. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. You're not angry with me. Oh, no. Only with myself. It was rotten of me to make you care. And then because of some noble sense of duty to leave you to get over it the best way you could. And there isn't a thing in the world I can do about it. Isabel depends on me more and more. She's ill and getting worse. Then there's Tina. Even if I could chuck everything, Oh, I wouldn't Charlotte... let you, Jerry. I knew you were married, and I walked right in with my eyes wide open. But you said it would make you happy. Oh, it has. I've got back my work, and that's due to you. Oh, I'd been hoping you'd say that. I'm more understanding for Tina. I'm kinder to Isabel, so don't blame yourself. Well, then don't you. It's different. It's not. Shall I tell you what you did for me? You made me feel important. You were my first friend. 
And then when you fell in love with me, I was so proud. And when I came home, I, I needed something to make me feel proud. And then your camellias arrived, and I, I knew you were thinking about me. Oh, I could have walked into a den of lions. As a matter of fact, I did, and the lions didn't hurt me. Please take back what you said. If you marry Elliot Livingston and have a full and happy life, I will. I'll try. I'll look for you around every corner. Goodbye, darling. Goodbye, darling. I did try. I wanted to marry Elliot, but it was of no use. We broke it off by mutual consent. And I knew then I would never have a home of my own, or a man of my own, or a child of my own. Why did you break the engagement? Because I don't love him, Mother. Have you no sense of obligation to your family? Or to me? Here you have the chance to join our name, Vale, with one of the finest families in the city. And you tell me you're not in love. You're behaving like a romantic girl of 18. I don't doubt it. And what do you intend to do with your life? Oh, get a cat and a parrot and live alone in single blessedness. You've never done anything to make your mother proud. Nor to make yourself proud, either. Why, I should think you'd be ashamed to be born and live all your life as Charlotte Vale. Miss Charlotte Vale. Dr. Jackworth says that tyranny is sometimes an expression of the maternal instinct. If that's a mother's love, I don't want any part of it. I didn't want to be born. You didn't want me either. It's been a calamity on both sides. Oh, mother, let's not quarrel. We've been getting along together so well lately. It was a horrid thing to say. Forgive me. Mother. Mother! What's the matter? Dora, she, she was sitting there and we quarreled. We... We quarreled. I did it. I did it. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act three of Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis and Gregory Peck, will follow in a moment. <clears throat> Meanwhile, I want to introduce our guest of the evening, the number one smoother of wheels at the David O. Selznick studio, Miss Lydia Schiller, who bears the title of scenario assistant. Reading scripts is one of your chores, isn't it, Miss Schiller? Yes, and I work on scenarios, too. I sit in on story conferences and then follow through on production details. What are you working on now, Lydia? Duel in the Sun. It has over a thousand people in the cast. And stars, I understand, Jennifer Jones, Joseph Cotton, Gregory Peck, and a host of others. That's right, Mr. Keeley. It was two years in preparation, one year shooting, and cost over five million dollars. Hmm, with a technicolor picture of that scope, you must have had many problems. We certainly did, Mr. Keeley. Now take the costumes, for example. Mr. Kennedy will be interested in how we kept them looking so lovely and fresh. How was that, Miss Schiller? We used Lux, naturally. We luxed all the blouses, lingerie, washable gowns, and of course, stockings. That helped keep down the stocking bills, didn't it? You're perfectly right, Mr. Kennedy. We had very little run trouble because stockings were luxed after every day's shooting. You found out by experience what has been proved by actual test. Strain tests made by a famous laboratory proved Lux cuts down runs amazingly. A strong soap and rubbing with cake soap made runs come quickly. Stockings actually lasted twice as long with Lux. Yes, we're luckier than the girls who lived in the days of Duel in the Sun. It take, uh, takes place in the 80s, you know, in Texas. Before Lux was invented. And a wonderful invention it was, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Miss Schiller. And now, a suggestion. Don't get discouraged if you don't find Lux the first time you try. Your dealer will have more soon. And Lux is worth waiting for. Here's your producer, Mr. William Keeley. We continue with the third act of Now Voyager. 
after which I hope you'll come backstage with us to meet tonight's stars. Betty Davis appearing now as Charlotte and Gregory Peck as Jerry Durrance with Joseph Kearns as Dr. Jaquith. My mother was dead. I had quarreled with her and I couldn't shake off the feeling of guilt. It grew worse and worse until at last I had to get away. I went back to the only refuge I had ever known, back to Cascade. How are you, Miss Vale? Dr. Jack required you were coming. Hello, Trask. Well, for goodness sake, I hardly know you. Oh, of course. I expected you hours ago. It's been a long drive. I'm tired. You suppose I could go to my room right away? Certainly. I put you in 18. Your old room, remember? I thought it would make you feel more at home. Oh, thank you. How was Dr. Jacklet? Same as ever, handing out common sense instead of sympathy. <laughs> Trask, that child over there at the table, who's she? A problem if I ever saw one. Her name is Christine Durrance. Uh, oh, excuse me a second. I'd better see about your bags. Tina Durrance, Jerry's child. She sat alone over a picture puzzle. Her eyes dull and staring behind her glasses. Her plain little face tightened into an expressionless mask. I went and stood beside her chair. She turned away from me. Hello. What's the picture supposed to be? I don't know. Do you mind if I join you? I'll collect all of the pink pieces. I know who you are. You do? You're my new nurse. No, I'm not. Oh, you can't fool me. And I know why you've come here. To make sure I don't run away from this place again. Oh, did you run away from here once? I didn't know. What's your name? You know my name. That's why you stood there and stared at me. Oh, that was very rude of me. But you see, you reminded me of somebody. Who? Well, if you must know, myself. Of course, at your age. Oh, Christine, your schedule calls for you to spend the evening with the young people next door. They don't want me. Oh, nonsense. Of course they want you. I've got a fine ping pong game all fixed up for you. Barbara and Betty against you and Bob. But he's the best player here. And I'll be the worst one. I'll die, I'll just die. Now you'll do nothing of the sort. <gasps> please, 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 don't make me, don't make me, oh, don't make me. Now, Chris, don't, don't make me. <laughs> but the doctor wants Christine to have exercise in the evening. I'll see that she has some exercise. I have to take my car down to the town and leave it at the garage to be washed. Christine could go with me. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Christine, oh, but Please I... let me go with this lady. I'll drink all my cocoa tonight, if you will. For goodness sake, Christine, don't carry on. Go get your coat. Oh, thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, Trask, I couldn't help it. <laughs> I thought you were too tired to do anything but just crawl into bed. I suppose Cascade has performed another miracle on me. Tina's room was next to mine. Late that night, I heard her. She was crying. Tina. Tina, what's the matter? Don't be afraid. What is it, Tina? Oh, don't leave me. Don't leave me. I won't till you're asleep. Tell me what's the matter. I'm ugly and mean and nobody likes me. Tina, you? I'm not pretty in the least. And they hate me. They all hate me. Who are they? Everybody. All the kids at school, Miss Trask and the nurses and the doctors. Oh, there must be something terribly wrong with me. Do you like them, Tina? Oh, no, I hate them. That's the trouble. If you want people to like you, you've got to like people. I bet you're only fooling me. Well, you try it and see. And in the meantime, it'll help you any. I like you. And I think you're very pretty and very sweet. You do? Really? Really. Now don't cry anymore. Oh, why are you so good to me? Because somebody was good to me once when I needed somebody. Now... Now, come on, go to sleep. Close your eyes and let your muscles go all limp. There, that's better. Much better. Jerry's child was in my arms. Jerry's child was clinging to me. Jerry's child. I hear you're running Cascade now, giving orders to Miss Trask, to my doctor. You mean about that child? Don't try to appear innocent. But I didn't give any orders. I only requested. I thought you came up here to have a nervous breakdown. Well, I've decided not to have one, if it's all the same to you. I see. Well, go on. 
I just think Tina is so unhappy here. I haven't anything to do with my time. Mightn't I be the nurse instead? I promise not to do anything again without first asking your permission. If only... Mm -hmm. Well, just go ahead and tell me what you'd do. I'd stay with her, pay attention to her, make her feel wanted and important. I'd... Well, I'd take her camping in the woods. She adores camping. Sounds like a wonderful break for her. Of course, I couldn't do it without her parents' permission. I wouldn't. What would her mother say, do you suppose? Oh, she'd accept any plan that would relieve her of the child who's always been a thorn in her side. Though the lady would loudly protest if she heard me say so. And her... her father, what would his attitude be? Sympathetic and protective. Possibly too protective for Christine's good. Result, resentment felt by the mother. See, the child's absence from home became desirable for all concerned, so I brought her here. I was highly recommended to the father by a friend of his, but uh, he placed her in my care, not yours. I suppose I'd better ask you something. How much do you remember about my trip to South America? Well, you sent some beautiful postcards. No, that's not what I mean, about an automobile art trip I made and the man who was with me. I never knew the gentleman's name. You never told me. I'd better tell you now. It was Tina's father. Tina's father? Mm -hmm. Does that alter the situation? Of course it does. I don't know anything about your relationship with Dorrance. I don't know how emotionally involved you are with him. I... I can't work in the dark. Well, I'll tell you everything. It's over. That's it in two words. And Tina needs me, and I... Well, I've never been needed before. <laughs> well, I'm crazy, but if you promise to behave yourself... Oh, thanks. But you're only on probation. Remember what it says in the Bible. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. How does it feel to be the Lord? Oh, no. <laughs> Jerry had to be told, of course, and though we never saw him, he sent a message through Tina. He asked her to thank me. And then came the time when we returned to Boston and the house was filled with young people. It was laughter and fun and Tina coming down the stairs in a new dress and her hair all curled and, and Jerry standing there. Tina. Daddy, oh, Daddy. Well, can this be Tina? Do I look nice? It's my first party dress. You look lovely. Do you really like me? Oh, I love you, darling. Tina, don't you think it'd be nice to show your father your room and your studio and everything? Would you like to see my room, Daddy? Oh, very much, if Miss Vale will pardon us. How long are you going to call her Miss Vale? What should I call her? I don't know. Would it sound too funny if you called her my name for her? Now, what name is that? We decided it on the camping trip. I call her Camille. Camille. I think it would sound very nice indeed. Jerry, what are you doing here all alone? Come and join the party. Uh, I want to speak to you, Charlotte. What about? Uh, to take Tina home. Take her home? But you... But you can't. Dr. Jackwell says it'll be the worst possible thing. Oh, I don't care what he says. Charlotte, I've accomplished very little with my life, but oddly enough, I've always managed to keep my self-respect. How am I to interpret that? By recognizing the sacrifice you're making and admitting it. I can't let you do it, Charlotte. I can't go on forever taking, taking, taking from you and giving nothing. Jerry, that's the most conventional, pious speech I've ever heard. Oh, forgive me. I know it's your pride, isn't it? Let me explain. You will be giving. Don't you know that to take is sometimes a way to give? The most beautiful way in the world if two people love each other? You'll be giving me Tina. Every single day I'll be taking and you'll be giving. That's very kind of you to put it that way. Well, then is it something that Tina has said? Don't you think she's happy here? Happy? She told me upstairs she loved you almost as much as she loves me. Well, what is the reason? Is it something about us? Well, of course it's about us. Why didn't you marry Livingston? I'll tell you why. Because I came along and ruined him for you. And now my child comes along and claims all your attention and takes your whole life when you should be trying to find some man who'll make you happy. Some man who will make me happy. Oh, so that's it. Here I've been laboring under the illusion that you and I were so in sympathy, so one, that you'd know without being asked what would make me happy. And you come up here to talk about some man. Jerry, you haven't the slightest conception of what torture it is to love a man and be shut out, to be always an outsider and an extra. Charlotte. When Tina said she'd come and stay with me, it was, well, it was like a miracle, like having my own child, a part of you. I thought you'd understand, but evidently you don't. Again, I've been just a sentimental fool. It's a tendency I have. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, 
I thought... I was afraid you were keeping Tina out of pity. Pity? But there wasn't any pity in your voice just now. <laughs> I feel very small, Charlotte, and very much ashamed. I'll never doubt you again. Thank you. Come here. Come here, Charlotte. No, Jack, please. Let me go. Listen, darling, Dr. Jackwith knows about us. When he said I could take Tina, he said, you're on probation. Do you know what that means? He allowed you to come here as a test. And if I can't stand the test, I'll lose Tina and we'll lose each other. Jerry, please help me. Well, uh, shall we have a cigarette on? Yes, please. May I sometimes come here? Oh, whenever you like. There are people here who love you. And it won't be for this time only. That is, if you'll help me keep what we have. We could talk about your child. Our child. Thank you. There's something else I, I want to tell you. I, I don't know how. Charlotte, I'm not afraid of what's ahead for us. We have a certain immunity, you and I. It's, it's a strange kind of love, isn't it, that keeps us apart. But it's stronger than both of us together. And it won't die. You believe that, Charlotte? And you will be happy. Oh, Jerry, don't let's ask for the moon. We have the stars. Betty Davis and Gregory Peck will return for a curtain call in just a moment. I read the other day that a neighbor of ours was getting married. So when I met her younger sister, I asked about Mary. Susie gave me a withering look. She gives me a pain. What now? Well, the airs Mary puts on. She came into the kitchen last night while Mom and I were doing the dishes. And of course, she hasn't touched a dishcloth since she's been dating Fred. Here was Mom, up to her elbows in suds. What do you suppose Mary said? From your look, it wasn't good. <laughs> the nerve of her. She said she couldn't possibly wash dishes when she got married because Fred's always raving about her soft white hands and she doesn't want to spoil them. And what did your mother say? Well, I spoke up before Mom had a chance. I said if her eyes weren't on Fred so much, she'd see that box of Lux right on the kitchen sink and she'd have taken a look at her own mother's hands. Why, since Mom changed to Lux, her hands look divine. So then what? <laughs> so Mary did take a look at Mom's hands and kissed her and said, whoopee, and off she went. To buy a box of Lux flakes? No, of course not. She had a date with Fred. But I could see she was impressed. Well, it is impressive, Susie. You see, the Lux people made a lot of actual tests. What kind of tests, Mr. Kennedy? They had women wash dishes with strong soaps. And you should have seen their hands. <laughs> like Mom's used to be, I guess. All red and rough. Yes. Then the same women changed to Lux Flakes, and their hands became soft and smooth and lovely again. Well, Mom says it costs hardly anything to use Lux for dishes. She says a big box lasts and lasts. That's true. Lux does go further. Lux does up to twice as many dishes, ounce per ounce, as other leading soaps tested. Your mother's a smart woman, Susie, and I'll bet your sister Mary will take after her. Here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. It gives me great pleasure to bring back to the footlights for their curtain call... Betty Davis and Gregory Peck, who appear together for the first time on any stage. Well, it seems natural to be on a stage with you again, Bill. And it's been a real privilege for me to play opposite Betty. Betty, I, I want you to know how proud we all are of the honor accorded you in Mexico as the first American screen star to be included on their role of honor. What was the occasion, Betty? Well, it was a screening of The Corn is Green in connection with the opening of a campaign to educate all Mexicans to read and write. And thousands of Mexicans who learn to write will be sending you and Greg fan mail, that I'm sure. Greg, I'm happy to see that your boss, David O. Selznick, won the December box office Blue Ribbon Award for Spellbound. Yes, I feel mighty lucky to have been in that picture, Bill. Oh, I don't think it was luck. I think for both of you, success was predetermined. It's a very nice thought, Bill. What do you mean? Well, you may not know it, but you were both born on the same day in April. And from ancient law, you know how the stars affect our lives. Well, I know how stars like Betty Davis affect mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm talking about the celestial stars. Well, I'm afraid that subject's a little over my head, Bill. 
Well, perhaps we'd better gravitate to the stars we're having in this theater next week. That's better, Bill. Who are they? They represent two generations of fine acting, Lionel Barrymore and Margaret O'Brien. In the 20th century, Fox hit Captain January. Captain January is a story of a bluff and salty lighthouse keeper and the light of his life, a little girl named Star. A story of how they face an often hostile world together, bound to each other by tenderness and understanding. They should be wonderful together in that play, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night. You took us on a very pleasant voyage. Before we part, may I leave with you a grave and vitally important message. In the recent war, we learned what loss of life and limb can mean in terms of human anguish. And yet in America today, there is a shocking toll of lives and human injuries through carelessness. Carelessness that since Pearl Harbor has killed more Americans at home than lost their lives in battle. Yes, it doesn't seem possible, but it's true. Most accidents are preventable if each of us will assume responsibility. Especially on public highways, drive with care. Observe all speed and traffic regulations. Be ready for unforeseen emergencies. Help stop the growing scourge of accidents throughout America. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Margaret O'Brien and Lionel Barrymore in Captain January. This is William Keeley saying goodnight to you from Hollywood. In reviewing the wartime record of the motion picture studios, their stars, executives, and personnel, America can be proud that its great entertainment industry, mobilized for victory, received the commendations of two presidents of the United States. Also, the commendations of the secretaries of war, the Navy, and the Treasury, as well as of the commanding officers of every military branch in every theater of the war. For its unstinted service in the cause of victory, the motion picture industry has earned the gratitude of all America. Betty Davis will soon be seen in the Warner Brothers picture, A Stolen Life. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. Our Lux Radio Theater production of Now Voyager, starring Betty Davis and Gregory Peck, has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the safe, gentle flakes, smart women everywhere, used for all nice washables. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Captain January with Margaret O'Brien and Lionel Barrymore. The Spry Treat of the Week. Tender golden spry pancakes to put you in high on brisk winter mornings. Mmm, mmm, taste the delicate flavor difference in pancakes made with spry the pure all-vegetable shortening that gives all your cooking a boost for the better. Rely on Spry. Next week's Lux Radio Theater presentation, Captain January, is based on a novel by Laura E. Richards, published and copyrighted by L.C. Page and Company. Be sure to listen. And why not tune in a half hour early to hear Joan Davis over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.